everybody, Zach W. Lorton here with the Backburner Podcast, and I want to tell you about this great game I just got in the mail today. It's called Paradox. It's published by Split Second Games and designed by Brian Sewer, who's a brand new designer in the board game front. But be watching for this guy because this is a fantastic game. I had a chance to kickstart this. The Kickstarter ended in July of 2015. I had a chance to play this game at Gen Con 2015 with Brian, the designer. This is a fantastic game. It plays in about a half hour to two hours, depending on how many people are playing. It's an awesome game. It combines a couple different mechanics, card drafting, and a match four. What's a match four? Well, if you've ever played a game like Bejeweled, or Candy Crush Saga, or Monster Busters, or something like that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And Brian Sword does an absolutely fantastic job of translating this type of game to the tabletop. So let's go ahead and take a look inside the box and see what's up. All right, so like I said before, we're taking a look at Paradox by Split Second Games. And take a look at this artwork. First of all, it's a very nice matte finish on this box. Very, very cool looking. The artwork is what actually drew me to this game in the first place. I saw the artwork. I was like, that looks like a really cool wormhole. And then I took a look at the Kickstarter project, and I was like, this is a fantastic type of thing. Artwork is very, very important, as you can tell in tabletop board games. And this particular board game has a lot of great artwork. First of all, you can actually see it on the side of the box. These are depictions of the different worlds that are represented in Paradox and in the different timelines. So I've already taken a look at some of this stuff. This is the operator's manual or the rules if, if you want to go with that way. It tells you everything about how to play the game like most rule books do. This one actually does a really great job of describing everything. You can almost not even have to worry about playing or not even have to worry about looking at a how to play this game video on the internet if you want to learn how to play this game. All you have to do is read through this. It's very, very cool. And there's a quick reference guide on the back, which is outstanding. Not a whole lot of games have something like this on the back. You have a player map for each one of your players. This allows you to be able to place planets uh, in a past section, a present section, and a future section. As you play the game, all of them move down and could be in danger of leaving the timeline. So this gives you information that you need for each one of your players. And this is the game board. This is where all the worlds are going to be located. Now, the worlds are in danger of being succumbed to something that's called the quake. The quake is this type of thing that moves around and destroys time whenever, or destroys planets whenever a timeline is saved. Now, one of the cool things about this is that this has got this really cool sets of components. I haven't even punched this out. I have. I got this earlier in the morning. I have been so, so for looking forward to checking this out. Each one of these is going to be a separate color. These are the colored discs that you use in what's called your matrix. And your matrix is going to be that thing that you use to swap colored discs to, in order to create energy. These are right here represent the planets. These represent the worlds that get saved. And then these types of tokens here are your alliance tokens. These can come up later in the game that can give you definite advantages uh, when, you, when you create timelines, when you create energy, and you need to spend them on something. The game also comes with this handy little drawstring bag to put all of those chips in. Now, they didn't have to do that. It may not be the best quality in the world, but you don't have to go out and buy a bag uh, buy a, you don't have to go out and buy a bottle of Crown Royal in order to do what you need to do. You can take all these, punch them out, throw them in here. It's all included. That's fantastic. These are shield tokens. So you can actually shield worlds and keep them from being ruptured. And then you have a couple of other tokens. One is to indicate the quake, and one is to indicate the round order. There's 12 rounds in a game. And then here are the cards. I haven't, well, I mean, this is brand new. I haven't even opened them yet. But these are really fantastic. And in just a moment, I'm going to open these. I'm going to show you the artwork on these because it's absolutely fantastic. All right, so we're taking a look at the game. This is how everything looks like when it's supposed to be set up like that. You've got your player mat here. You've got an individual matrix for every single player. You're going to have 25 discs, five down, five down, five across. And as you can tell, uh, you can tell these discs have different symbols on them. You've got triangles. And these are double-sided discs, which is great. Even though they were punch-outs, they made them double-sided. So you got triangles, you got plus signs or X's. I don't know how exactly that operates. And then you have circles. The idea is to be able to choose worlds from a stable wormhole or an unstable wormhole, either one, and put those onto your timeline. Now, as I said before, the timeline gives you a place where you can put cards in the past, in the present, in the future. And you're trying to save timelines 
in all three timelines, as many as you possibly can from different worlds. In order to do that, you know, the, the more timelines that you save of a, of a particular world, the more victory points you can get. And by the end of the game, whoever has the most victory points is the winner. So you're trying to get the most points. That's the thing. The first person to go in the round is going to be given this card, the Chief Scientist card. Now, if you're the type of person that likes to sleeve your cards, uh, it's definitely going to be worth it on this particular game. Even the artwork is really cool on the back. And, I mean, take a look at this. You've got research gold cards, which looks fantastic on these, and they give you different research goals that you can go towards. And the back of the cards have that awesome artwork that's on the box cover. That's phenomenal. It looks fantastic. These are great. Okay, so here is where we have all the planets. This thing represents the quake, and as one of the worlds gets uh, saved, gets rescued from the quake, it actually triggers the quake and the quake moves. So for instance, if you were to save a world that's in the present timeline, or if you were to draft this, what you would want to do is decide, okay, I'm going to put this on my present area. This tells me the number of energy that it's going to require to actually save that timeline. So I would need two of the red disks energy in order to save that. If I were to save that, then that triggers the quake. Now, if you rescue a past world, it advances five spaces. One, two, three, four, five. If you were to save a present timeline world, it advances three. A future timeline only advances one. So if I were to register enough energy in red disks that I could actually use it to save that planet, that would trigger this quake, three worlds. Bang, bang, bang. And then that world becomes fractured. If a world becomes fractured, that means that that can keep those planets from actually being scored at the end of the game. So the idea is you want to be able to save those planets if they get fractured. You do that by spending either black or red or white energy, or you can also spend black or white energy to shield a world. And if the quake hits that at that point, then all it does is just break the shield. It's very, very cool. So the way this particular game works is that when it's your turn, after you've drafted what you're going to be using uh, what you're going to be trying to save, then what you want to do is you want to go to the matrix phase. And this is where the match four really comes into play. You want to try and match discs of the same symbols to create matching lines, either a line of four or a line of five. Now, I don't have enough to be able to make uh, a five in a row with the red, even though I have two here and two here. I'm poised to be able to make a five, but I don't have a red O in here. So what I can do is I can use two actions. You get two actions during the matrix phase. I can swap this white triangle with this red triangle right here for one action. And then my second action, I can swap this red plus sign for this blue plus sign right up here. And then that allows me to take these and I get to claim one energy from this. If you save a row of four, you get one energy. If you save a row of five, you get two. I get one energy in this. I'm going to place these on my discard pile because that'll go back in the bag. And I'm going to go ahead and put this right here to indicate that I'm being that I'm using it. At the end of that turn, what I do then is I reload my matrix. And you always go from left to right. And you go from the bottom up. So if there's anything up above, like if I, if I were to clear like this row right here, if I were to clear uh, that right there, then these would drop down and then I would fill in left to right from there. That's the way that kind of works. So it's very similar to what you would find, like I said, in a drop four, drop three, match three type game like Bejeweled or something like that. So I would fill that in and now I have more to work with. So what happens then at the end of the turn is that every single card moves to the next place on the timeline. And then after that round, like for instance, in the next round that comes, I don't have enough to be able to actually purchase another red energy. So at the end of that round, what I would do is basically clear some lines and hope I get some more discs, some more red energy. That would go to the final part, the final place on the timeline, on my player mat. If I cannot save the world by the time it gets to that point, then I lose anything that I've spent towards it. And this goes to a discard pile. It is lost forever. Absolutely forever. That's a bad thing. You don't want that to happen. So it's a really fun game. The idea is that the more 
the more worlds in, or the more timelines of a particular world that you save, the more points you can get. If you save one world, it's worth one point. If you save two worlds, two timelines in that world, it's worth three points. If you save three, it's worth six points. And if you save all three plus what's called the matrix card in that world, it's worth an additional 10 points. Or basically any combination of one, two, three, and four can get you the corresponding point values, one, three, six, or 10. This is a fantastic game. One of the other things that you can do from the matrix is that you can swap out one of these, uh, one of these chips here with something that's in what they call the anomaly. The anomaly has the ability to give you additional resources, and that's something that anybody, any player can pull from. The really cool thing about this game is that you have a lot of different options available. Like, for instance, if you have, if you make a match here using, let's say, blue, and you want to get blue disks of energy. Well, you use all these blue disks of energy, but you don't have a planet in the timeline that requires blue energy. What you can do is you can use this to purchase an alliance with a blue faction. When that happens, that allows you to be able to use this as a blue resource, a blue energy that you can use anytime in, you know, in the future of the game. If you have one of these by the end of the game, it equals one victory point. However, another player can also, another player can also uh, spend one of their energy to remove this faction from you, and then another uh, spend another energy to buy it themselves. So that's that's a possibility that you can create alliances, and then other players can break them and steal stuff from you. It's a fantastic game with a really great, really innovative um, mechanic in here. A couple other things that can come into play is that you have research goals. Now, this is optional. It's advanced. You don't have to throw that in. Uh, if you're playing this for the very first time, maybe not. But the research goals give you different things that you can do to create uh, more opportunities to earn points. Like, for instance, this one. Uh, for the number of alien minerals you have, it's in the one card. For every one planet that you save that has an alien mineral symbol on the top right-hand corner, like, for instance, uh, World G here, it's got an alien mineral symbol on the top. For every single card that you save that's not fractured, you get to earn one victory point. Uh, and if any research goal that's in this spot, if you save one that uses atomic energy, like uh, the world, the future world of K, Katalima. Uh, for every two of these types of cards in this spot, you earn three victory points. And then here's one for any shielded planets in your score pile. And that's hard to do. So any shielded planets that you have in your score pile. So if you have a couple shields on a couple different planets out there, and let's say a shield is on the G planet, and you've got two cards from the G planet in your score pile, for every three of those, for every three of those, you get six victory points. Well, if you don't have three, you don't get any points. So if you had three or more, you would get six victory points because you would basically work for that. And it was basically the same thing for every other world. There are different types of research goals available. There are different types of cards that you can play. The Nexus card, uh, what these do is these cause you to block off part of your matrix. I'm going to fill this in here just to give you an example scenario of what that might look like. So if you were to take this, the Nexus, you would put this in the past position. And this little dot up here tells you where your nexus, where your uh, matrix is going to be shielded, and that's the upper right-hand corner right there. So what that means is that that cannot be swapped with anything until you make a match that clears that out. So if I thought, oh, that would be good if I could place this blue O here and then this blue triangle here, that'd be fantastic, except, well, that doesn't match because it's, it's red anyway. But let's just say for the sake of argument that that was, hey, let's just say that was a blue plus and it was shielded. I would be able to go ahead and clear that out, take the shield off and clear that out. Uh, but if I were to clear something underneath it, like for instance, I had, you know, a blue zero here, and let's say that was there instead of here. If I were to clear this out, right, then normally all these would fall down. But unfortunately, this stays here. So that would fall, that would fall, these would fall into place, but you still have a space underneath that. So when you fill everything in your matrix, you have to go from the bottom up. That would get filled in first. And then you would go to one and to two and to three, etc. So 
there's a couple different things to keep in mind when you play the game. A couple different clarifications that'll come up as you play. Uh, there is one other thing I'd like to let you know about, and those are a couple different scenarios. You can get scenario cards uh, that get put into... Hello. I'm going to throw all those over the place. Uh, this is what they call a flare scenario. Uh, this gets placed... If this comes up in your timeline and you choose to use this, you would put it in your past. And each different type of scenario has a different type of stipulation to it. So what this does is this gives you different... Um, different scenarios, different things that can happen as you resolve. You know, I want to resolve one yellow energy. This will allow me to discard one disc from my matrix and refill. So if there was one on my matrix that I wanted to get rid of, or if I thought maybe another one would work better in that place, I could do that. Uh, using a red energy would allow you to discard one column or one whole row from your matrix and refill. Finally, if you were able to spend a blue energy before it got to uh, the off and go off of your timeline completely, then you would get two victory points at the game's end, or you'd be able to remove from the game to take one additional matrix action if you wanted to do that. So there's different scenarios like this that can help you in many, many ways in the game. There are some scenarios that are called trigger scenarios, and this is one of these, like the matrix scenario. These purple discs are called trigger discs, and if you're playing a two-player game, then the triggered scenario happens if you were to pull out three trigger discs over the course of the game. So if I were to pull out two, and I reach in here, and I'm, I'm trying to grab a disc out, and one of the discs I grab happens to be another purple one, then what that does is that triggers the next matrix scenario, and it goes to the second level. And what that does is that changes the way that you can create matches. Now they have to be in two by two or two by three. And instead of, you know, horizontal or vertical lines and stuff like that. So this can add another level of complexity to the game. Uh, the trigger scenarios are completely optional. You don't have to use them. But if you'd like to throw in some complexity, uh, there's all sorts of different ways that you can make this game different and unique. There's tons of replayability in this game. And, uh, I, you know, I, I sound like I'm being really enthusiastic about it, and i, I got to tell you, I am. I am very excited that I got this game. I have been waiting for this game since last July, and I am very, very happy that it's here. I could... There's no solo variant... Um, available for the game, but I intend to set this up and play this as a solo variant myself just because I want to. Uh, also because I don't have a chance to get together with gamers all that often and play games like this. So uh, I want to give a big shout out to the folks at Split Second Games for uh, picking this up and deciding to run with this and publish this game. I want to give a big shout out to Brian Sewer, the game designer. He, de he designed a fantastic game. The artwork on here is fantastic. The artwork on all the cards is something really, really cool. You know, I mentioned that there's past timelines, present timelines, and future timelines in each world. And the artwork actually kind of goes along with that, which is really cool. I'm going to see if I can show you a couple examples of past, present, and future. The really neat thing about this game is that um, there were different artists. There were three different artists. I'm sorry, there were 15 different artists that were brought in to create art for each one of the 15 different worlds. And each one is as unique as the next. That's it's honestly some of the best things about the game that I've seen is the way this sucker looks. The way the game looks and feels is just phenomenal. I knew there was another D somewhere. Here it is. It's actually in. I was I was playing with it earlier. <laughs> so, I mean, you just take a look at this real quick. You have the future timeline for the D world, which is Dixel. You have the present timeline, and then you have the past timeline. They've created these to be triptychs. So, it shows different parts in the timeline. Very, very cool. And every single world has a different, unique... Um, perspective on what the world is going to look like. So my recommendation to you is buy this game. It's $39.99. Uh, you can actually get it from splitsecondgames.com. You can actually buy it on Amazon. It's being sold by Split Second Games through Amazon. Uh, one of the other things that you can get is you can get upgrades to these energy discs. They can be made out of wood. It's an additional $20 to do that. I chose not to do that because... Well, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know why. Uh, I'm kind of wishing I did now because these are kind of light. They're actually put together very well, and they punch out of that uh, the punch board. 
woo, punch boards, uh, punch out of this very, very easily. It's like bang, 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 bang. They came out really, really easily, really quick. No snagging, no nothing. So really good quality on this. Great quality on the cards. The cards are very, very nice quality. They look fantastic. The art, like I said, the artwork on this is is second to none. If you're looking for a great science fiction themed game that uh, does a lot of work with the theme and the mechanic is unique and innovative, this is one that you're definitely going to like. I would recommend this to anybody that likes sci-fi. I would like this, I would recommend this to anybody that's ever played and enjoyed Bejeweled. Uh, this is it's really cool just to be able to get this on you know on your on your table and be able to manipulate these things and say yeah I got that and clear that there's some satisfaction saying I cleared a row I cleared a column yes I have energy now and I think I'm gonna use that energy and I'm gonna I'm gonna shield a planet that's what I'm gonna do you know it, this is this is just great great game. I would recommend this to anybody, honestly. Uh, it's, it says it's recommended for 10 and up. I think 10-year-olds could easily pick up on this. My nephew is 12, and he would be able to get this like that, no time flat. It plays in about 60 minutes to uh, two hours. Uh, it's about a half hour per player. And uh, when I played this at Gen Con, it did take us two hours to do it because it was four people playing, and none of us had ever played the game before. There are other, uh, you know, how do you play this game uh, videos on the internet. A few by the designer, Brian Source. So check those out if you have any questions. Uh, but otherwise, I would totally check this out. The game is Paradox. Go get it.